And now on BBC Radio 4, the journalist and writer John Ronson continues his series by asking, what characteristics do we need to be a good spy? So if Johnny's enthusiasm and inquisitiveness and desire to do the right thing were not character traits that make a good spy, then what are? What kind of person do you have to be? I'm in Folkestone on my way to meet John Simmons, who's now in his 70s and trying to tell people about his spying days. It looks like a sort of retirement, so a seaside retirement block. Take off my sunglasses. I don't want him to think that uh, the KGB are back. Hello. Hello there. John. John. Yeah, yeah, hi. Come in. John. <laughs> When you were a child, did you want to have a life of adventure and intrigue? Well, yes, I think so. I was a very adventurous child, and I was often in trouble for that. And I liked fighting. And I think like, I, like I, playground fighting? Playground fighting, and I was always in trouble. And because I became a sort of a gang leader. Oh, yes. I set up my own gang of small ruffians, and we used to chase other gangs and fight with them. Did you ever hurt anyone? Yes, I did. Did you feel sort of bad about it? No, because what happened was I was horribly bullied. And I said to my father, you know, I don't want to go to school because this other boy keeps hitting me and twisting my arm and poking me. And, and so what he did, he showed me all the weak points of another small boy. You don't hit him on the head, you hit him in the throat, yeah? You don't kick him on the shin, you kick him in the balls. So I went to school and sorted this boy out. And that was a good feeling. I can sort of enjoy that feeling now. And then I started going through the whole school. But did you then become the bully? Yeah, but not of innocent little children. I always went for a bully. I loaded my school bag with a huge, heavy, solid oak pencil box. Yes. And as he came past, I took his one with his head. (laughs) Bonk. And he was injured quite badly. And how did that feel? Good. Yeah, good. John grew up left school and became a police officer in the Flying Squad. But then one day in the 1970s, he was accused of corruption. The newspapers said he took bribes from gangsters like Charlie Richardson. John denied it, and he still does. I read in the paper one day that I was corrupt and I'd been demanding money off this poor little criminal. Completely untrue. I knew I'd be fitted up, and so I went abroad and I thought, well, I'll bring the whole ship down. So John says he was bitter... He went to Morocco and planned to write a book about police corruption in London in the 1970s. But he never did write the book. Instead, he got involved with a bunch of shady former British soldiers. And then one day he got chatting to a friend of one of them who said he was a recruiter for the KGB. This could be an even better way of getting back at the UK, John thought. You don't just walk into the KGB. It's a long sort of process and they check up on everything and how many children I had and where were they now, and my own weaknesses. In the midst of his KGB tryout phase, he was in a bar chatting up a woman whose husband happened to be high up in the West German government. John told his KGB handler, whose name was Nick, and he replied that maybe John could try and get some secrets out of her. So you had to seduce her? So, yeah, they told me to take her to Berlin gave me a hotel to stay in, which was obviously completely rigged up as a sort of honey trap nest. And, of course, we had some mad, passionate love. And everything went on to film, every word spoken was on there. Do you feel a bit embarrassed about that, or do you feel like you probably put on a good show and it was all OK? No, it's quite funny in a way, because I was always potent. High sex drive, but low in competence. Ha- right. Because I obviously wasn't bothering about her. Apparently everyone was laughing. At KGB headquarters? Yeah. So then they can see, if I'm going to be a Romeo spy, I need to be taught. Yes. Being a Romeo spy is not the sex. It's getting into the confidence, it's being gentle, treating them nicely. How long did these lessons go on for? Weeks. During the day, I was being taught secret writing, avoiding uh, being followed and stuff like that. And then I went back to my room and there was this girl waiting for me in my room. Giving you sex lessons? Yeah. Just pure sexual teaching. I was astonished, because I thought I was a man of the world. 
I was a babe in arms. John was declared ready, he says, and he was sent out by the KGB to seduce women. In nearly every case, they were from embassies. I went to most of the countries, the whole lot, really. Never Britain, but British girls in British embassies. How did you chat them up? Well, I had to use my charm and meet them casually somewhere. Yeah. You do uh, have a kind of twinkle-eyed charm. Yeah. yeah, that was useful then. Did you have kind of chat-up lines that always worked? No, I made friends with them. Decent manners as well. When they talk, you listen carefully. Mm. You remember what they're saying. And when you reply, it's relevant and to the point. But then once you'd got what you wanted out of the women, you would just leave and go on to the next one? Yes. For John, being inquisitive wasn't important at all. What was, was being ruthless. He was filled with ruthlessness and a righteous indignation, the need for revenge. John didn't believe in anything bigger than himself, like spies are supposed to but he did believe very much in himself. So how many women did you have sex with on behalf of the KGB? I would say many, dozens. 90% of the women were as hard as nuts. You're working in an embassy, you know, sex running wild there. And in fact, it got too much in the end. They burnt me out. That's why I left them in the end. Burnt you out? How so? Well, because when they found me, I was a very virile young man although I didn't realise just how virile I was. Then they exploited me and my body. In other words, they used me as a prostitute, in a way. And it meant that in my 40s, I started, you know, not getting erections to order. You gave your erections to the KGB? Yeah, and now I want to sue them for damages. <laughs> they want some erections back. Yeah. <laughs> Were the women ever blackmailed by the KGB after you gave them information? Yeah, some of them were, yeah, which was sad. Some of the women weren't anything to do with diplomacy, diplomatic corps, whatever. And there was one that I'm still a bit sorry about, it was a Chinese girl, a lovely, lovely little Chinese girl. And she was on holiday in Singapore. She was going on a tour bus every day, and I ended up sitting next to her and making friends with her. And she was tiny and like a little porcelain statuette. And I was really fond for her. That's good if you can make yourself fond of somebody because it shows in your manner, your attitude, your face, your eyes, everything. Mm. But anyway, I took her out, complimented her, kept looking at her adoringly and whatnot. We slept together, but in a special room, and I knew that everything was being photographed. You said that you felt sorry for her. Sorry for her, yes, because later on I found out she was the daughter or only child of a hugely rich Taiwanese businessman who had massive factories and was engaged in making all sorts of secret stuff for the Americans. And what happened to her? Did they go to her with the film? No, they went to the father with the film. And do you know what happened as a result of it? Yeah, he started handing over the American secrets. It was a huge success. The threat to him was, help us with the plans for this latest whatever it is, radar or whatever... Or he should be published, he should go out, and that's his life ruined. And her life and the family disgraced. So what do you think when you look back on that? No. I'm very ashamed of it. Genuinely so? I know, well, I didn't know what was going to happen, did I? Broke her father's heart, didn't it? And she was beautiful and lovely, and she fell in love with me. There will be some women listening to this who of course, will, yeah. will be furious. But and... you'll be surprised. You yeah. play that to women, yes? Yeah. And There'll be a lot of oh, women listening. Shocked. Oh, they might throw something at me. No, there'd be a lot of women wanting an introduction to me or something like that. Even though you sound so terribly misogynist and callous and yeah. ruthless. Yeah. What do you think the KGB saw in you that they thought that you would make a good Romeo spy? Do you think you're quite good at being manipulative? Yes. And you always have been, and like you manipulating me now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just asking you a question. Yeah. <laughs> and things like empathy and remorse, you don't feel a, a huge amount of. It shows you prove what a crank I am. The only things I have remorse about are my dogs, a series of dogs that have all died. Mm. 
because they gave me unconditional love their whole lives. And sometimes in the night I think I feel sad about such and such a dog which probably died 20 years ago. Scruffy little mongrel, you know. Mm. But they're the only creatures that have got through to me like that. Yeah. People I've harmed seriously or destroyed. Poo. Uh, but I do feel sorry about that Chinese girl, one and a few other cases. In the end, John says, he had enough. He came back to London and turned himself in. I didn't want to go to my grave, which I'm apparently going to now anyway, on the record as a corrupt officer who was caught and fled the country. But the British authorities didn't prosecute. They sent John to jail for a year for the original corruption charges. But when it came to the KGB honey trap stuff, they said he was a fantasist and that he'd made the whole thing up. John says that was their way of discrediting him and they needed to discredit him because he had too many secrets about corruption in the Home Office and so on. One person who does believe him is his wife, Nellie. I have very mixed feelings, and I prefer not to think about it. When I think, I become sad. Do you ever think about the feelings of the other women? I think that the one thing which is missing, he has to offer an apology to all these women. Maybe he's the sort of person who just doesn't feel remorse. I don't know. He must. I do, for very small things. Does he? Do you see him feeling remorse about small things? I don't know. Not very often. And has he been a good husband these last... How many years? What, 20 years? Well, 10 years. 10 years, ten years now. Interesting. <laughs> In what way? Yeah. <laughs> Life is always interesting with John. He has a very nice sense of humour and there is never a boring moment with him. So more like a roller coaster than a roundabout. Yeah. After I left John, I had the creeping sense that maybe he was a fantasist. Maybe he had made the whole story up. So I looked him up in the Mitrokin archive. Vasily Mitrokin was for 30 years an archivist working within the KGB. His files have become the world's most detailed and trustworthy record of KGB life. Mitrokin writes that a John Simons spent eight years as a Romeo spy using seduction and romance to recruit or obtain classified information from a series of female officers. This was a, the best hotel in, in Delhi. So that's uh, you it, being a spy? Yeah, I had a fabulous time. Can you imagine a Romeo spy being sent all around the world to all these places? Well, unlimited a... expense yeah. accounts. It was the best time of my life. <laughs> John Ronson on Spying was presented by John Ronson. The producers were Simon Jacobs and Laura Parfit. It was a unique production for BBC Radio 4. The other case that springs to mind that is also quite recent uh, is again one of the most extraordinary. Not uh, completely documented in uh, my historical dictionary of sexpionage because I know that he's going to be writing his own book. But This is uh, a man who I've got to know really quite well and his story in terms of the KGB and Soviet espionage is one of the most astonishing that I have ever come across. And believe me, I've come across a few. In 1972, ex-detective Sergeant John Simons was uh, about to appear at the Old Bailey to be charged with um, corruption. Now, John Simons had been a army officer in uh, a short military career and then he had joined the Metropolitan Police. Uh, he had worked uh, first of all as a bobby on the beat, then he had joined the Criminal Investigation Division and he uh, had been assigned at one stage to Scotland Yard where he had acted as a driver for, for the commander in charge of what was called the the, the Dirty Squad, um, but actually it was the Obscene Publication Squad and their role was to arrest pornographers, to control the strip clubs uh, in Soho uh, and to deal with the dirty magazine shops. So the Dirty Squad um, had a, a bit of a reputation and John Simons was the driver to the commander of that squad, but only for about six months. He subsequently was promoted 
and he became a detective sergeant in Peckham, which is in southeast London, and he was arrested on a charge of corruption. And it's what he described as noble cause corruption. His method, as he had been taught by older colleagues within the CID, was to recruit informants, in effect, by coercing them. He would have a suspect in the back of his car, he would hand them a stick of dynamite, and uh, naturally any self-respecting criminal would, would take one look at the dynamite, try not to touch it, but if, if he's handed it, will touch it and hand it straight back again. And that was the cue for John Simons to make his pitch. Your fingerprints are now on that stick of gelignite. Unless you assist me and you become my informant or my snout in the jargon, then at the very next safe-cracking case, that stick of dynamite is going to be found right beside the safe. And believe me, juries are always hugely impressed by those forensic experts who say, yes, the defendant's fingerprints were found on that stick of gelignite. And even if you've got uh, a cast iron alibi, any jury is going to convict you and you're going to go to jail for a long stretch. Well, that's the kind of pressure that works uh, in southeast London on the criminal fraternity. And John Simons used this uh, system uh, and he called it noble cause corruption. It was to get results but eventually he was caught out. There was a complaint about uh, his methods. A newspaper was able to entrap him doing exactly this job and he and uh, his partner were arrested. Now he was able through some pretty shrewd lawyering to be able to separate his trial from his partner his partner went to the Old Bailey, was convicted of corruption, and John Simons was appalled to see his uh, brother officer being sent down for seven years. Went to prison, and John Simons decided to leave the country. So uh, immediately after the conviction of his partner, not wishing to face trial himself, he left the country, and he did so on a false passport, and he went to Morocco. He tried to get work as a mercenary, but on one of his first jobs in West Africa, he fell ill with malaria. He came back to Morocco, and in Tangier, because he was having to spend a lot of time uh, in, uh, uh, recovering from, uh, from malaria, he decided to write an account of his corrupt work within the Metropolitan Police Force. And in particular, he concentrated on the detectives at Scotland Yard that he had encountered, those in the dirty squad who had run a protection racket in Soho. They had been extracting money uh, from some of the, the strip joints, uh, some of the clip joints, some of the dirty magazine shops. So in effect, the obscene publication squad was sort of licensing some of these sites to operate and anybody who didn't pay off the police would be closed down. And John Simons over a period wrote a very detailed account of everything that he could remember, every corrupt police officer that he ever encountered. And at that time, in the mid to late 1960s in the Metropolitan Police, there were a very large number. So John Simons produced this extraordinary dossier and news of its existence reached the KGB residentura uh, in Tangier. And uh, a man came to see uh, John Simons when he was still recovering from his uh, malaria and claimed to be some kind of a publication agent who would be interested in getting access to the manuscript that John had written. Well. Uh, John Simons felt that this was really at his only insurance policy about going to, uh, uh, to prevent him from going to jail. He felt that one day when he went back to London to face the music, he might have some kind of bargaining chip with this manuscript, really detailing the dates and places uh, of the corrupt actions that he had witnessed. But undeterred, this uh, Soviet officer asked John Simons, whether he had any knowledge of a particular Soviet defector, Oleg Lyalin, who had uh, defected in London in at the end of August 1972. And one of those strange chances 
John Simons did know a special branch officer who had been the personal protection officer assigned to the job of guarding Oleg Lialin. And he said, yes, uh, I know plenty of detectives. I know many people in the Metropolitan Police Special Branch. And uh, yes, indeed, I happen to know somebody uh, who's in contact with, uh, with Lialin. The KGB officer, as he then declared himself to be, said, would you be willing to go back to England and assassinate Oleg Lialin for us? And uh, John Simons drew the line at that. He said, I've been a mercenary. I have been a corrupt police officer, but I am not going to be engaged in uh, assassination or murder, and I'm certainly not going to work against British interests. But undeterred, the KGB resident invited him to continue his recuperation from uh, malaria uh, at a resort on the Black Sea coast in Bulgaria. So John Simons, now pretty low on funds, agreed that he would be delighted to accept this invitation. Went to uh, Bulgaria, and he was a tall, good-looking man, well-spoken. Uh, he was pretty fit. He had uh, he really enjoyed skiing, and he was sort of at the prime of his life. And th this tragedy that had befallen him had, of course, ruined his career and made it almost impossible for him to go back to the United Kingdom. So while he was in Bulgaria, uh, he encountered a beautiful German girl on the beach. And uh, one thing led to another. And the German girl disclosed, uh, at, uh, after a night of frenzied, passionate love, uh, that uh, she was married, that she felt pretty bad about this relationship. And John very casually asked her what her husband did. And he explained, she explained, that her husband was a senior official in the German chancellery in Bonn and that uh, he had been unable to accompany her on uh, her vacation because he was engaged at that very moment on an important investigation. John asked a little bit more and she revealed that there was a German, there was a, there was a German in the, uh, the chancellor's office uh, who was suspected of espionage and it was her husband who was about to identify the mole. Now, John Simons never received the name uh, of Gunther Guillaume, but that is indeed the mole who was in uh, the Chancellor's office. And uh, when Viktor Budanov, who was his handler, his case officer in Bulgaria, when he next met him for a drink, he explained that he had met this beautiful German girl, that he had developed a relationship with her and that the only way that he could repay the KGB for uh, the, their generosity was to give them this tip that if they had a mole or some kind of a spy was about to be arrested in the German Chancery. Well, the KGB tried to act on it. We don't know what happened, but Gunther Guillaume uh, was arrested. And clearly, the, the warning didn't reach Gunter Guillaume or the KGB in time. But this demonstrated to the KGB, at least, that John Simons was a willing, pliable individual. He was then taken to Moscow, and he was made the most extraordinary offer. The offer was this, that uh, if he agreed to become a Soviet illegal working for the KGB, uh, he would have uh, all his travel funded, he would be paid a large amount of money, uh, and there was only one serious disadvantage to the task that had been assigned to him. His task was to travel around the world and seduce the wives and daughters of CIA officers. Now, John is a very remarkable man, but he, sort of typical Brit, doesn't know a great deal about the fairer sex and is always embarrassed and slightly fumbling uh, in his any kind of rumpy pumpy that he'd been involved with in the past. So uh, John said that uh, whilst he would be delighted to take on this task, he would under no circumstances work against British interests, but he didn't mind too much about working against the Americans, um, but that most of his sexual experience had really been behind the bike sheds uh, at his secondary school. And he wasn't entirely sure that he was up to the task. So the KGB produced two of the most beautiful Moscow hookers 
who worked uh, permanently for the KGB, usually for the second chief directorate, involved in honey traps. And they were classic swallows. These were the girls who worked uh, sometimes in uh, embassies, sometimes as domestic staff in the, uh, in the private residences. Uh, oftentimes they would be involved in honey trap operations in, in hotels. And these two girls, uh, for three months, taught John Simons all the skills that the ladies ever wanted. Now, I don't want to go into detail, and, uh, well, I do, but I'm not allowed to. I, I was told at Chapel Hill when I was first being interviewed for uh, a pre-interview for a radio interview when I wanted to give an account of the particular skills that John Simons had acquired, um, the word orgasm just passed my lips. Um, and even though we were talking down a telephone line, I could hear my interviewer blush. So, uh, and it was explained to me that that is a word that is unacceptable on national public radio. So I had to think of alternatives. But John didn't think of alternatives. He was quite happy for the real thing. And these two hookers taught John really extraordinary skills. And I don't want to embarrass the ladies, but you know what lousy lovers most men are, don't you? You know that. You don't have to be told that. Uh, they're selfish. They don't think of a girl's needs. Um, and, you know, girls have different needs. And uh, these two hookers explained everything to John. And uh, John, was, he told me that after three months, he was completely exhausted. Uh, on the other hand, he, he learned a very great deal. And he became, uh, I think it's reasonable to say, one of the world's great lovers. And for the next eight years, John Simons traveled the world. His cover was that he was the manager of a safari park in East Africa, that uh, he was on vacation, that he was a white hunter, uh, that he had uh, great skills with, um, with a rifle um, and indeed with other instruments, and that he was assigned by the KGB to go to particular places where he would be guided by the KGB to a target, and these invariably were the wives or daughters, usually of Americans working under a business cover in various different parts of the world. And they were suspected. For instance, the, um, the Pan Am manager in Dar es Salaam was suspected by the KGB to be a CIA officer operating under non-official cover. And John was given a very detailed brief. Um, the, the wife uh, of this uh, Pan Am manager uh, collects seashells, and she will be um, on the beach most afternoons collecting her shells, and that will be an opportunity for you to bump into her. And then the rest is up to you. And John developed these skills. He exploited um, the ridiculous accent that many Brits have uh, and that seem to be appreciated by Americans. And one way or another, he was able to worm his way into the affections uh, of these unsuspecting uh, ladies. So they were daughters and they were wives uh, of CIA officers. And his task was to uh, pleasure the ladies and to uh, ensure that they had a really good time and that uh, in the aftermath, in the pillow talk that would follow, um, the issue of uh, her, uh, the husband or the father's secret career um, would be disclosed. And that is what John did for eight years. He operated in India. He operated right across Africa. Uh, he operated in, in Japan. And he really was one of the most extraordinary spies of all time. He was very effective for uh, the KGB. He would come back from time to time uh, to Moscow where he would be given a new assignment and occasionally he'd be given a bit of an update by the two hookers. So just in case he had you know, lost his touch, um, they kept him up to scratch. But after eight years, I have to say that John was absolutely exhausted and uh, he really felt that enough was enough and he also believed that sufficient time had passed that he would be able to go back to England and negotiate some kind of a deal with MI5, the British Security Service, 
because he had acquired all this knowledge over the past eight years of the KGB. Um, and of course, he had his secret insurance policy, which was the manuscript that he had uh, uh, written and developed, uh, which was an expose of corruption of the Metropolitan Police. And after eight years of continuous oral sex, he'd really had enough. So he returned uh, to London. He made contact with uh, his lawyer. Uh, his lawyer made contact with MI5. And the suggestion, the pitch was this. Uh, my client has been working for the KGB as a spy all over the world. He has valuable information about the residenturas, both legal and illegal, that he's operated with in Australia, in India and Japan and right across Africa. Uh, he has very valuable information about the personalities, about the methodology, and much of this information, of course, may be of huge interest to the CIA. He insisted that he had never operated against British interests, although there was actually one secretary at the British Embassy in uh, Moscow who gave a slightly different version of events, but we will leave that aside. That was the pitch that was made by John Simons' lawyers to the security service. Well, what do you think the security service did? They went straight round to Scotland Yard and said, we have uh, ex-detective Sergeant John Simons uh, who is making a pitch to us. Uh, he's telling us that he's been a Soviet spy for the last eight years, and he also tells us that there are a large number of corrupt police officers in Scotland Yard, and he has all the details. What do you think? Well, here's a surprise. Scotland Yard said he's a fantasist. He's made it all up. It couldn't be true. There are no corrupt police officers in the Metropolitan Police, and the chances are that he's made up a cock and uh, bull story, excuse the expression, uh, to uh, uh, try and in try and reduce the sentence uh, that he's going to get. So MI5 rejected John Simons's offer. Uh, he was convicted. Uh, he then went to prison. Uh, he served only three years uh, of, a, of a prison sentence, and he came out of prison a broken man. Uh, he came out of prison a broken man because, of course, police officers are not popular uh, in Her Majesty's prisons, and nor are corrupt police officers. So he had a very rough time. And uh, it wasn't until 1999 that his life was absolutely transformed. Because in 1999, a KGB defector named Vasily Mitrokin uh, revealed that he had defected seven years earlier and that in 1992 he had been exfiltrated from the Soviet Union uh, through Riga, uh, had come to the United Kingdom. Uh, his son and his wife had also been exfiltrated, and most importantly of all, he had brought with him uh, copies of documents that he had made while he had been the KGB archivist. He had worked as the archivist in the first chief directorate, and also in the illegals directorate of the KGB. And he left behind, under his dacha just outside Moscow, a vast archive that he had collected over a period of 15 years of files that he had purloined or copied in the KGB headquarters at Yasnevo. Now, when Vasily Mitrokin arrived in England in conditions of very great secrecy, in 1992, MI5 and the British Secret Intelligence Service, of course, asked him straight away, uh, are there any current spies? Who are the most important spies that you're aware of? We need to look at your files and identify uh, any existing spies. And of course, to their amazement, uh, according to Vasily Mitrokin, the top Soviet spy who was British was codenamed Scott. And Scott, he revealed, was a former corrupt police officer, Detective Sergeant John Simons. So it wasn't for a further seven years until the Metrokian archives were published in London that uh, Scott was identified. And this whole story 
of John Simons traveling around the world and seducing the wives and daughters of CIA officers was revealed for the first time. And of course, it followed that because he had been rejected by MI5 as a fantasist in the first place, uh, they had also rejected the proposition that there had been a large number of corrupt police officers uh, in the Metropolitan Police CID and in Scotland Yard. So John Simons's life started again in 1999 when he was vindicated. And the evidence supporting John Simons is very clear indeed. As soon as the Parliamentary Intelligence and Security Committee discovered that uh, a spy codenamed Scott was arguably one of the most important spies, British spies that had acted for the KGB, uh, the uh, Intelligence and Security Committee uh, tried to find out why it was that uh, John Simons had never been interviewed by MI5. And then they learned that, of course, Scotland Yard had said the man is a fantasist, it, it's all nonsense. But in those documents, that came from the illegals directorate from the archive. There was page after page describing each girl and each lady that had been seduced by John, uh, some of the techniques that he had used, really pretty lurid stuff, uh, and uh, the results. So John was finally vindicated. Um, he was exposed, uh, of course, in the Metrokian archives uh, as somebody who had not exactly betrayed his country, but certainly had betrayed Western interests. Uh, he received subsequently an immunity from prosecution uh, in return for a very detailed account of the various different CIA officers that he had compromised. And so I hope that in the next year or two, John Simons will be able to uh, write his own book. It, he's virtually completed the manuscript um, and I have to tell you, it is not for the faint-hearted. I'm not saying there's a lot of gynecological detail in there, but, um, but it, it, it's pretty tough stuff. I mean, this is, this is, this is R-rated, I believe, is the expression. So, John Simons was a remarkable man, I and mean, he is determined to publish his book, and I very much hope that we can persuade Bernie to arrange for John Simons to come to a future spy conference so that he can give some of the male audience a few clues. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much indeed for allowing me to address you.